Thanks very much, Ray, for that uh, introduction and the invitation, and to Jasmine, too, for doing a terrific job uh, organising this event. Well, the rise of ecology um, has uh, taught us that the natural world is in intricately interdependent uh, and that the flourishing of human life uh, depends on uh, the, a carefully balanced complex of systems. In a uh, reprise to the existential concerns of the uh, Cold War over mutually assured destruction, uh, accepting the finitude of the Earth has forced us to consider again the mortality of the species. The lesson uh, of ecology, whether considered as a science or a philosophy, um, is that humans are, above all, part of the natural world, uh, both uh, deeply implicated in it and subject to its laws. And to solve the ecological crisis, we must learn to live within these laws. The Industrial Revolution led us to believe uh, that science and te technology gave us the power to control nature. Uh, but we've now, uh, we are now discovering uh, that nature is unable to satisfy our unlimited desires and that the laws of nature are now turning against us. If we're to survive and prosper, we have to learn to be humble in the face of nature's power. This uh, humility, which is so at odds with the triumphalism of two centuries of technological and industrial expansion, <coughs> this humility suggests the need for a new ecological consciousness. According to one view, we must uh, use our reason to overcome our appetites, to calculate the limits and live within them. And uh, by that means make ourselves subject to nature's laws. Yet reason has never been a sufficiently powerful uh, means of changing our behaviour, nor uh, how we construct a different type of society. An ecological consciousness uh, built on science can appeal to our reason, but it can't appeal to the inner sense of our self uh, that's responsible for our unlimited desires. For that, we need to change the way we think about ourselves in our essence, rather than in our relationship to natural systems. This is an idea I develop in my forthcoming book, The Freedom Paradox, but I'll just give a few hints at it here. There's a sense, which I think is accessible to all of us, that behind the everyday world is another world of deeper reality, a world that is, in the words of Arthur Schopenhauer, hidden behind nature and which renders nature possible. In Eastern philosophy, this deeper reality is said to be imbued with what's sometimes called a subtle essence, a kind of universal energy that pervades all things and sustains the everyday world. In this view, all creation is the manifestation of this subtle essence. Although the essence manifests itself in different forms, its universality gives rise to an unbreakable connection between all things. If we want to know the essence of nature, we can find it in ourselves. As Schopenhauer wrote, a glance into the interior of nature is certainly granted to us, insofar as this is nothing but our own inner being. It was a truth echoed by Goethe, who wrote, is not the core of nature in the heart of man? And Wordsworth expressed the same insight, one I suspect that most of us have had some time or another standing in a eucalypt forest, although in the case of Wordsworth, he was standing in an English wood in the springtime when he wrote, one impulse from a vernal wood may teach you more of man, of moral evil 
and of good than all the sages can. Schopenhauer coined the striking aphorism, which I've borrowed for my title, we must learn to understand nature from ourselves, not ourselves from nature. Ecology can teach us about the conditions of life, but it can't tell us who we are in our inner selves. In contrast to the official philosophies that separate humans from the world by way of our rationality, and which see the exercise of rationality as the means by which we can save the world, Schopenhauer sought that which unites us with the world rather than that which separates us from it. For him, in sharp contrast to Kant, the moral principle that governs relations between humans also governs the relationship of humans to the natural world. Kant's revolutionary philosophy saw rationality triumph over theology and promised to render humans autonomous for the first time. Human well-being became an end in itself. But where does this leave non-human beings, except as mere means to human ends? Indeed, Kant himself declared that man can have no duty to any beings except human, which is the essential philosophical position of free market economics and the principle on which the market everywhere operates. Schopenhauer observed that such a principle, which treats animals only as means to human ends, fails to recognise the eternal essence, as he wrote, that exists in every living thing and shines forth with inscrutable insignificance from all eyes that see the sun. In contrast to the Kantian view and that of modern economics, a moral theory grounded in the metaphysics of empathy naturally embraces all living things. Most other philosophical approaches posit a moral gulf between humans and the natural world, whether that gulf be ordained by God or established by rationality. Yet everywhere in the face of all such chauvinism, as Schopenhauer wrote, nature enters her silent protest. For does not every creature have a will to live equivalent to that of every human? Indeed, that will of other creatures may be stronger than that in humans, since humans are the only creatures that at times decide to abrogate their will to live. Although the phenomenal forms of creatures may be distinct, what is primary, the universal essence, is common to all. The compassionate person understands this intuitively. Although explained in evolutionary rather than metaphysical terms, E.O. Wilson's biophilia hypothesis, according to which, which refers to uh, the innately emotional affiliation of human beings to other living organisms, is easily recognisable in this argument. In his uh, famous essay, Shooting an Elephant, George Orwell um, wrote about his inexplicable remorse which was nothing more than the recognition, I'd suggest, of the universal self in the elephant he shot. As Schopenhauer wrote, in man, as in the animal that does not think, there prevails as a lasting state of mind the certainty springing from innermost consciousness that he is nature, the world itself. Whether arrived at uh, philosophically or experimentally, such an appreciation reflects an expansion of the self, in Warwick Fox's uh, phrase, one that initiates an ethical viewpoint that also expands to take into consideration the interests of all creatures and the systems that sustain them. In place of a moral order that emerges from scientific understanding or that's handed down from some higher authority, this, this ethic grows out of a transformation of the self. Of course, the argument I'm putting 
concerning the identification of ourselves with nature could not be further from the position of unrestrained exploitation of the natural world that's characterised the history of industrial capitalism and that only in the last three decades has come under challenge. The instrumentalist approach to the natural environment, which sees uh, the environment as no more than a catalogue of resources whose values are measured by their economic usefulness to humans as expressed in the price they ca can command in the market, that instrumentalist approach is a metaphysical error and a moral failure with potentially catastrophic effects for humankind. Only an approach that attributes intrinsic value to the natural world, including its uh, individual, species and systemic components, represents a break from the attitude of exploitation. I'm suggesting that the chance for a reconcili reconciliation with nature is, at the same time, an opportunity for reconciliation with ourselves. Well, as this suggests, the emergence of a new ecological consciousness will depend not so much on a change in our beliefs and attitudes, these are subsidiary, but on the emergence of a new sense of self and the relationship of that self to the natural world. In the first instance, we then have to understand how people construct a sense of self. That is, how they form their personal identity and how they act out those identities. I'll suggest that in an affluent society, the conception of self has been transformed in recent decades in ways that make an ecological consciousness a more remote prospect. And that reversing this trend will depend either on severe environmental shocks or, one can only hope, a widespread change in the process of self-creation induced by a collapse of public confidence in the consumer life. The implication is that, the achieving, that achieving true sustainability, and especially solving climate change, is first and foremost one of philosophical transformation. The observations I now want to make apply to affluent countries, although many developing countries are rapidly evolving into societies with many of the same characteristics. While well, the most deep-seated structural change in Western societies over the last three or so decades has been the reversal of the traditional relationship between production and consumption, a change that's rendered, I'd suggest, obsolete ideologies and political programs founded in the 19th and early 20th centuries. In short, I'll argue, over the last three or four decades, we've entered a new phase with the transition from what I'll call a production society to a consumption society. The production and consumption societies I describe should be considered as um, ideal types in the Weberian sense, that is, synthetic concepts designed to capture essential characteristics and a process of historical transformation. The transition from the production society to the consumption society has the following several features. In the production society, economic growth was determined by investment and the pivotal factor was investor confidence. In the consumption society, it's determined more by consumer confidence, which in turn is influenced by the availability of consumer credit. Previously, corporations competed with each other through the efficiency of their production processes. Products were largely standardised and success depended on the refinement of the production process with various phases including tailorization and mass production. Now, however, differentiation rather than standardization characterizes products. This means that marketing creativity has replaced production efficiency as the key to competitiveness and corporate success. Third, in the production society, Prices for standardised products were the focus of both consumers and producers. 
for most goods and services now in the consumer society, price is a secondary consideration. For most consumer goods, the cost of investing goods with often intangible qualities that contribute nothing to the practical usefulness of the items now exceeds the costs of manufacturing the items themselves. The emblematic case, I guess, is the $200 pair of running shoes that actually costs $20 to manufacture. The difference is not corporate profits, but the huge investment in marketing that goes into um, uh, yeah, injecting into those running shoes uh, certain intangible qualities or associations which people believe they're buying when they pay their $200. Next. While previously advertising was a subsidiary aspect of business organisation, marketing departments now dominate production departments within firms. In the production society, consumers were seen to have given tastes and the task of advertising was to persuade them that the product in question would satisfy their needs. Today, marketers are engaged in an endless process of creating and transforming, as well as responding to consumer desires. Previously, the extent and composition of consumption were closely tied to the place of the household in the production process, and in particular their location in the class structure. Now, consumption is intimately tied to the creation and reproduction of a sense of self. And these identities are only loosely connected to the place of households in the production process, only loosely connected to class. Luxury consumption is no longer confined to the rich, but reaches down to all consumer groups. Finally, in the production society, personal identity was determined above all by the culture of the group or class to which one belonged. In the consumption society, people's place in the social order is much more fluid and relies less on their occupations and more on their consumption decisions which reflect ideas of self-creation and lifestyle. The shift from production to consumption has also had profound implications for the nature of class, the reproduction of culture and the political process, themes I expound on particularly in growth fetish. The structural transformation represented by the shift from production to consumption has been reinforced by other social changes. The new social movements of the 60s and 70s, which rejected traditional standards, uh, expectations and stereotypes, were a manifestation of the deeper human longing for self-determination. The democratic impulse which until the 70s took the form of collective struggles to be free of political and social oppression, had metamorphosed into something else, a, sense, uh, a search for authentic self or a true form of individuality. The changes wrought by the new social movements, including the removal of educational and workplace barriers to women, for the first time provided the opportunity for the mass of ordinary people to aspire to something beyond material security and freedom from political oppression. However, before they had an opportunity to reflect on their newfound freedom and to answer the question, how should I live? The market has arrived with their own answer to the quest for autonomous identity. Over the last two or three decades, the marketers have seized on the desire for authentic identity in order to sell us more gym shoes, cars, mobile phones and home furnishings. The inability of consumerism to allow true realisation of human potential manifests itself to an ever increasing degree in restless dissatisfaction, chronic stress and private despair. Feelings that give rise to a rash of psychological disorders, including anxiety, depression, and widespread substance abuse. 
we engage in a range of behaviours aimed at compensating for or covering up these feelings, including many forms of self-medication. Advertising, long ago, discarded the practice of selling a product on the merits of its useful features. Modern marketing builds symbolic associations between the product and the psychological states of potential consumers, sometimes targeting known feelings of inadequacy, aspiration or expectation, and sometimes setting out to create, deliberately, a sense of inadequacy in order to rem remedy it with the product being sold. All aspects of human psychology, our fears, our sources of shame, our sexuality, our spiritual yearnings, are treasure houses to be plundered in the search for a commercial edge. It's virtually impossible today to buy any product that is not invested with certain symbols of identity acquired by the buyer, knowingly or otherwise. The beauty of this approach is that consumers can never get what they want. Products and brands can never give real meaning to human lives, so consumers lapse into a permanent state of unfulfilled desire. Ulrich Beck, the sociologist, has argued that in place of societies in which people living in largely homogeneous neighbourhoods and communities form their sense of self by unconsciously absorbing the cultural norms and behaviours of those around them, we nowadays, instead of that, live in an era of individualisation. The term refers to the requirement to create one's own self, to write one's own biography, instead of having it more or less drafted by the circumstances of one's birth. The new imperative arises in a society saturated by the outpourings of the mass media, in which the symbols of achievement and the characters worthy of emulation appear on the screen and the pages of the magazines rather than in local communities or in handed down stories of the saintly or the stoic. The process of individualization creates the social conditions for the flourishing of modern consumerism by providing the opportunity for the marketers of goods to step in and satisfy the desire to find and express a self. In truth, the individuality of the marketing society is a pseudo-individuality, as if there were an invisible hand guiding the pen that each of us takes up to write our own biography. Beck's individualised society is in fact structured, highly structured, by opaque institutions that exercise influence over us in beguiling rather than menacing ways. Well, what does all of this mean for sustainability? The process of individualisation and the role of marketing in self-creation suggests the need for a radical rethinking of the strategies to bring about sustainable relationships between humanity and the natural world. Yet much of the effort of environmentalists, um, which is aimed at shifting consciousness, has focused on what might be called green consumerism, an approach that threatens to entrench the very attitudes and behaviours that are antithetical to sustainability.